You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. My name is Sean Wilkie, and along with my awesome co-host, we interview the innovators in this space every week. Super excited to start today's episode. Ivan, please go ahead and introduce today's guest. Hey, I'm Ivan Zak, and I'm very excited to introduce our friend Kenichiro Yagi, or he goes by Ken, which is much easier for me. Ken is a veterinary technician specialist in ECC and internal medicine, having been in the field for 22 years on the floor. He's a manager, educator, a speaker, author, and editor, and an advocate for veterinary nursing. Ken is the first chief veterinary nursing officer in the U.S. at Veterinary Emergency Group, or VEG. He is on the executive committee for the Recover Initiative. He is a past president of and uh, NAFTA, which is a National American Veterinary Technician Association. Is that correct? National Association of Veterinary <laughs> Technicians. National Association. Okay. And has participated in many veterinary initiatives uh, that advance the field. Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you for finding the time. Thanks for having me. So uh, there's a lot of stuff happening and a lot of hype around lack of talent. And it all started with veterinarians. There's, I think, a lot of stuff that is uh, geared towards the veterinarians and burnout. And and when I started, this, this is going to be the third year that we conduct the survey on the burnout in the veterinary domain. And repeatedly, we've seen that technicians are burning out more than the veterinarians. And we need to pay attention to that. So what is leading to shortage of technicians in our domain? And what do you have to say about that? Yeah, there's certainly a lot of uh, things that we can say about um, the current shortage that we have today. Uh, It certainly has to do with retention. All the things that uh, probably apply to veterinarians apply to veterinary nurses as well, that there's burnout, uh, certainly compassion fatigue, two different things. Uh, one of the key things that always comes up is uh, that we're not paid well enough, that it's not a sustainable uh, wage that we're getting. And so then people tend to be forced to work more than one job to try to make ends meet, and that becomes unsustainable. And so then they look elsewhere. Um, I think that uh, there are certainly things to say about the type of role and job that people expect it to be in as they come into this nursing field and uh, actually play out in the field. So things about uh, how well we're utilized in terms of our education and training that we get. Um, There's also a conversation surrounding does credentialing actually matter that uh, people who became credentialed may feel like it didn't make a difference for them or people who have been in the field for a very long time Uh, without being credentialed and serving this role, um, do they feel undervalued themselves that uh, they aren't credentialed, but they have the experience? And so there's a little bit of uh, back and forth between the two types of people uh, as well that causes a little bit of tension. Uh, But ultimately, it it comes down to uh, do people have potential to continue growing or do they feel like they hit a ceiling and they can't continue to grow and earn Uh, the pay that they need in order to be able to live appropriately? And do they feel like they have a fulfilling career? And I think that's what it comes down to is that can we look at this as a career and us as a contributing member that have our voices heard in the practices themselves? So one small question, but uh, follow up with a, with a bigger question. So uh, you introduced yourself and you're talking about the field as the veterinary nursing which I love. I mean, that's the term that I use, but uh, I'm, you know, when I came to North America, I'm an immigrant. I was told that you can't call technicians nurses because there's this whole dilemma about it. Can you just define that for us again? Is uh, Why is it nursing technicians and what is allowed, what is not allowed? Like, what's the newest about this? So uh, if we take a look at our profession, uh, veterinary technician is the terminology, legal terminology that's used for our profession. People become credentialed as veterinary technicians. That's what the veterinary medical boards um, use for the state governance of our licensure or registration or certification. Uh, So the official terminology for our credential is licensed veterinary technician, certified veterinary technician or registered veterinary technician, and in Tennessee, licensed veterinary medical technician. NAFTA um, launched an initiative called the Veterinary Nurse Initiative back in 2017 that took a look at the state of our profession. Uh, If you take a look at all 50 states, there's 
each of the states look a little bit different in terms of how the profession is governed. So we wanted to standardize how that was being instituted. Same credentialing requirements, uh, well-defined scope of practice, uh, protection of our titles so that the people who are credentialed are the ones that are being called the title that we think. And uh, as we went through surveying, talking to the leadership of um, state organizations, as well as national organizations, and did uh, a lot of our due diligence, um, it came to that uh, the survey results indicated that we wanted to try to make the change to veterinary nurse as well, because as our profession evolved, we started to see ourselves uh, not so much as technicians, because it has a certain connotation of the type of work that we do, but we were really going into the nursing care and the patient care aspect that uh, we were uh, evolving into. Now, there's definitely um, differences in opinion, depending on who you talk to out in the field regarding this. Uh, that uh, some people may not feel like uh, we want to be narrowed into just nursing care or patient care, that we do a lot more than that, um, like, say, lab work or dentistry work that uh, the human nurses uh, may not uh, necessarily have a heavy hand in. But uh, the nurses out there, human nurses out there, do have a uh, um, hand in each of these areas that we might think they actually don't. But the human medical field is actually a lot more specialized and sophisticated than what we see in veterinary medicine. Um, so let me stop there a second and see what you guys have. Oh, I got so much. It's um, it's really interesting. It's so great to have you here, Ken, because there's more veterinary technicians, nurses, you people in the world than there is veterinarians. And we have a lot of people that listen to our show. And I know that you're an innovator in this space. So what direction does the profession need to go in when it comes to veterinary technicians, nurses, the titles, the accreditation? Where are the gaps and where are the opportunities? Like you're kind of the guy. So what do you think? <laughs> um, so let's start with uh, credentialing in general, that uh, not all the states currently have credentialing for uh, veterinary technicians yet. And uh, so uh, when it comes to standardizing our credential, um, we do want to get to the point where in all states, our profession is state governed, meaning that there's licensure established because that does uphold a higher standard for people who work in our profession in order to help the patients in the best way that we can. So function in our role the best way. And so there's um, hopefully less um, risk to uh, us taking on the role that we do. So the tasks that we perform, perform uh, administering anesthesia, monitoring patients, uh, providing fluid therapy, all that has a lot of knowledge uh, involved in it that we need to know why we're doing certain things and what kinds of things we see in the patients and responding to their uh, actually uh, being able to assess their response to the treatments that we have provided in order to make decisions on what needs to happen next, along with the veterinarian, obviously. And so um, we want to get to the point where education is a part of qualifying to serve our role. And we're not quite there yet uh, in all the states. Um, and uh, there's certainly private credentialing, so certification that's being issued in all the states. Um, so if you take all 50 states, there's some sort of certification or licensure in place. So the requirement of having a AVMA accredited program degree and passing the national examination called the VTNE and becoming certified or licensed in each of the states is there. Then we come to scope of practice. What can we actually do? Um, and we know that the veterinarians um, can provide the diagnosis, uh, prescribe treatment, perform surgery, and also provide a prognosis. And that's restricted to licensed veterinarians. Anything else can be done by other people. And the other people could be credentialed veterinary technicians or non-credentialed individuals, veterinary assistants that are uh, in the hospital. But in many states, the credentialed veterinary technicians and veterinary assistants, the uh, work that they actually do, it's the same. And so people can have and learn by experience in order to perform the role of uh, uh, credentialed veterinary technician. And that's where it gets, starts to get a little bit um, like uh, we would want to get to the point where uh, we do require a certain level of education so that uh, we, uh, the people who serve our role, have the knowledge that they need in order to serve our role best and be the best people to take care of the patients. Now, when I start saying things like this, um, I, I think we start to upset uh, some people because there are people who have been in the field for like decades, right? Been in this role and they know exactly what they're doing and they can serve our uh, serve the technician role very well. 
And so some of them may not see the value of going back to school now and trying to get the education. And uh, you know, we know that there are people like that and that we uh, work together as a team on the same team providing nursing care. And that, I think that uh, part uh, is, um, we have that in the field today because of the progression that any profession would have as licensure comes in. Now, these people will start to retire and we have, we have people coming into the field today that don't have the experience and they aren't equipped with the basic education that they need to serve our role. And those are the people that uh, we want to encourage to go to school and properly become licensed so that uh, they can serve our patients the best way possible. So I'm probably gonna step on the landmine here, but so I'm one of those uh, people that did work as a technician without license or registered uh, as a technician when I just came to Canada. 20 years ago. So I worked in the clinic. Uh, I had my education as a veterinarian from another country. And then I came in here and I realized uh, first I started by uh, working as a janitor in the clinic. Uh, then I was an animal sort of handling or animal health attendant, they, they call them. And then I realized that I could expand into other functions as a technician, but I never pursued licensing as a technician. Uh, and then I just went to vet school. Again, yes. the second time. <laughs> in a different language. And I'm going to go to China and do it in Chinese next. So, or maybe in Mandarin, I should say. <laughs> but the thing is that it just makes sense, the licensing. And, and the reason why I'm explaining my background, because because I did work and I think that I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't resist the fact that I couldn't work as a technician if I'm not licensed. Uh, there's Plumbing, you know, plumbers have to have licenses. The electricians have to have licenses. Veterinarians have to have licenses. Why not technicians? And why do we resist that? Is that is that just a one thing that we need to break one day and say, look, like to do certain things, like perform anesthesia, and you know, there's life threatening things associated with that. That you do need certain licenses. And another thing that I found going for the second time through veterinary education is that my education wasn't there. I mean, coming from Ukraine. Um, and stepping into the North American hospital is completely different. And I have a lot of friends that are coming from countries when, you know, the, their main focus was a camel as a veterinarian. And then you come in and you work with companion animals. It's a completely different beast, if you will. So knowing that I work in the environment where if I say, you know, I need certain drug dose and, you know, or are we discussing the same premedication or things like that? Knowing that there's a standard that allows me that conversation and not, you know, starting from what the drug is and they've, you know, everything about it. I mean, it does make sense to me. The probably question that I would want to ask, where do you sit if, um, so consolidation is happening in the industry. And uh, I don't know VG policy on, but I assume that you are hiring, you know, registered technicians and uh, licensed technicians for licensed technician professions. So it's probably a bit easier when you're hiring. That's just a requirement. But with the acquisition-based consolidation, when someone acquires the hospital, they're trying to navigate their way through our licensing in the industry. And for the most part, most consolidators are not familiar with the industry. So there's always a fear is that the standard will be brought in that everybody who is doing technician work should be licensed veterinary technician. And then it becomes a touchy point because, well, you have a clinic where people have been doing things for 20 years and they know what they're doing but they don't have licensing. So where do you sit on, on this as the hospital acquired and then you're a big corporation that needs to maintain compliance with the local regulatory bodies in all aspects of life and business? So what do you think is the legitimate path to consolidators? Is it just let's continue doing what we have been doing or does that create exposure from compliance perspective and the new consolidator that comes in should say well we should implement this licensed technicians only so sorry, sorry it's probably a can of worms that they, i just walked you in but <laughs> you seem uh, you seem very uh, <laughs> flippant on this topic so um i can definitely talk from what we decided to do because it's a realistic issue for us as well right because um i think that if we were to say we can only hire credentialed veterinary technicians for the role and the state says only credentialed veterinary technicians can do these things and nobody else can do them there's the immediate worry of do we have enough people uh, can we hire enough people or can we That's find right. enough credentialed people that uh, is going to allow us to run the hospital and and so that 
probably is a realistic concern thinking about all the hospitals that are out there and the number of credentialed individuals out in the field. Um, but what we decided to do was to make sure that credentialing does matter, meaning that uh, we, um, I think uh, a lot of people know uh, about us through the uh, pay scale that we put out there for the nursing care team in general that uh, we have uh, credentialed uh, veterinary technicians that we hired on into the position of veterinary nurses earning uh, at a minimum $23 an hour all the way up to $40 an hour. VTS is um, all the way up to $48 an hour. And so that kind of blew people's minds uh, in terms of how well, uh, how well we decided to compensate uh, credentialed uh, veterinary technicians. And um, Experienced veterinary assistants would also uh, like be paid well according to our pay scale as well. So there's a $5 difference between the two, but uh, we put that out there to say that we want you to think of this as a career and uh, you'll be able to uh, have just one job that you can focus on and uh, grow through this. And that's what we decided to do. And with that change, um, what we did was that we also created a credential support program that ultimately pays for the entire tuition for people who want to become credentialed. And uh, then they turn into a veterinary nurse with us. Um, and the reason why we did that was because if you think about the reasons why people couldn't go to uh, school and become licensed is because um, of uh, financial concerns. It becomes number one. They already don't get paid well enough. And so it's hard to save up to be able to go to school and uh, become credentialed. And um, the other big barrier is time. Do they have enough time with uh, working full time, taking care of their family members? Can they actually go to school, right? And so that's another one. And then the other one, uh, the third one might be more um, academic uh, support that uh, many of these uh, programs are say distance-based uh, distance based learning. Uh, once you get into the field as you're working full time, it's hard to take time away to actually enroll in school and be in a brick or mortar. So they, a lot of people tend to do distance learning. And so we decided to at least solve two of those issues, which is the finances. We support them fully in terms of the finances. Once they become credentialed, they get a pay raise and they also have a credentialing bonus that they get so that we can celebrate that they became credentialed. And the other one that we could try to solve is the academic support that we have uh, study groups. We have a credential support uh, specialist, uh, Betsy Hensley here, that is continuously working with them, having one-on-one -on -one conversations, creating BTNE study groups, things like that, that will help people get through the schooling process. And so we try to remove as many of the barriers as possible so that they can become credentialed and uh, be encouraged to do so. And so a lot of the reasons why people don't, don't tend to do it now has gone away. And so if they want to join VEG, uh, we encourage them if they're not credentialed to become credentialed and we provide them the means to do so. If there are people who um, are looking towards VEG to work here and they're not credentialed, they're offered the opportunity to do so and some of them still may not be able to because of extenuating circumstances, but let's remove those people. And if there are people who say, I don't need any education, education doesn't matter, then we would consider them um, sorry, not likely to be a fit for our culture, that we want people who want to continue growing, continue learning, gaining the skills and the education in order to serve their role better. And so uh, that's how we decided to work on that. And so I think that um, definitely the consolidators out there, uh, we're a de novo business in that uh, we establish and build uh, practices instead of acquire practices uh, so that, that we can set in the right culture from the very beginning. But either way, I think that practice groups out there definitely have um, an opportunity to provide the resources that people need and encourage people and, and instill a culture of learning that makes people want to learn to become credentialed and solve this issue. So Ken, I had like six more questions that I wanted to ask you, but we blew through the 20 minutes like we do every episode. So uh, to keep our promise to our listeners, we've got a couple questions uh, to wrap things up. So a book, a TED Talk, a YouTube video is something that you found inspiring along your career journey so far. Yeah, I think that um, I kind of thought about this and said uh, some of the standard things like uh, starting with, with why with uh, Simon Sinek is uh, something that I think we all resonate with, that we need to have our why and the reason why we do this. And I could definitely tell a story regarding that on what my why is, but for another time. 
things like a leadership challenge that uh, allows us uh, who are in the leadership role to encourage more people to become leader leaders, step up to the table of debate and discussion on how the field should move forward. That's another good one. Um, I did want to throw in uh, one that I tend to think about a lot more these days uh, was called High Conflict. Um, and this is a book that sort of describes um, how conflict arises once people set into conflict, how they could maybe like dig their heels in and not be able to solve the issues and tend to remain in conflict uh, and how to resolve things like that. And within it, there's the concept of um, conflict entrepreneurs that uh, sometimes uh, having that conflict allows them to thrive. And so how do we break down those barriers and come together for a common goal and move forward together is uh, what that book goes over. So I kind of enjoyed that. Don't worry, we'll have you back again. So. Go ahead. No, that's great. I'd actually be interested to read that book. Uh, and then do you have anybody in our industry that is as innovative and uh, as uh, outspoken in the industry that you would uh, recommend to invite to this show? Yeah. Um, so I think that I'd like to recommend uh, Christine Crick. Um, she just joined our team as the director of nursing practice. But the reason why we um, had her come on board is because when you think about where our profession should be headed, where is veterinary nursing going? What can we learn from the human nursing field and bring into uh, our industry? And what are things that we might want to avoid? So if you think about a lot of the progressive things that are going on out there, she's one of the most knowledgeable people of that same kind of passion. And I feel like uh, I've gained another thought partner that I can debate with in terms of um, where veterinary nursing should be headed. Uh, so I think you would enjoy her uh, approach to how to make change in the field as well. Thank you so much for listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. If you want to hear about our new episodes, please follow us on any social media channel. Also, you can check out our website at veterinaryinnovationpodcast.com. See you next week.